Old Testament reading this morning is from the fourth Sunday of Lent, is from Isaiah chapter 42, beginning at verse 14. There's a lot of uh, names in here that it's hard to understand who's uh, speaking. So let me begin by saying that it, the first part is talking, it's the God talking to us. For a long time, I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will grasp, gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all the vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In past that they have not known, I will, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places in the, in the level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. So talking about people of Israel, they are turning back utterly put to shame who trust in the carved idols, who say to metal images, you are my God. Hear you deaf and take your blind, and look you blind that you may see. Who is blind but my servant Israel or deaf as my messenger who I send, who is blind as my dedicated one or blind as a servant of the Lord. He sees things, he sees many things, but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to magnify the law and make it glorious. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel for today comes from the ninth chapter of St. John. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it is not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the work of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night, night is coming when no one can work and as long as i am in the world i am the light of the world and having said these things he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva then he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him go wash in the pool of siloam which means sent so he went and washed and came back seeing the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying is this not the man who used to sit and beg some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. And he kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. 
So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisee asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I wash and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they again said to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son? Who you, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Do you, why do you want to hear it again? Do you want also to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, you are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know what God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, you were born in utter sin and you would teach us and they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out and having found him said, do you believe in the son of man? And he answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into the world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. This is the gospel of the Lord. David, a blind man, and ourselves have much in common. We all have fears. David was a young boy when he faced Goliath, and he had taken his brother's lunch one day and heard the giant Phil Philistine from Gath throwing down the gauntlet, I defy the God of Israel. Send me a man that let him fight me. And if he wins, we, the Philistine army, will be your servants. But if I win, the army of Israel will be our servants. And lo and behold, no Israelite soldier stepped forward. But this young boy, not a trained soldier, but a simple shepherd, went and stood before the nine-foot Philistine warrior. David knew God fought the battles for Israel. And taking one smooth stone, he hurled it at Goliath and with precision killed him and took his head as evidence to the king and the people. King Saul then inscripted David to lead many men into battles and lead, and, and each time they saw victory. And the crowds would begin to chant, Saul has killed his thousands, but David 
his tens of thousands. And the chorus is respectful to the king. It honors King Saul. But it truly lauds and glorifies David. It was that greater praise to David that kindled Saul's jealousy over David. And so Saul begins to find a way to kill David. Twice Saul picked up a spear next to him and threw it at David to try to pin him to the wall. Twice David escaped. Then Saul began to find ways to capture David, to find him as he ran away with only one idea. I am going to kill this boy. It was the love of David's wife. It was the friendship of Saul's own son, Jonathan, that David was able to escape. And as he fled for fear out of his life, he realized there's no home to go back to. Death pursues me from Saul. And ahead and all around me are my enemies, the Philistines, many of whom I have killed their fathers and brothers. There's only the open road ahead. And I have no foreseen end. Generations later, a man was growing up, only seeing darkness, light and color, sight and seeing. They were useless words. He could not comprehend them. Learning was only by touch or by sound, and formal education was nothing he could participate in. A blind man could not Learn a trade. Survival meant I have to beg, calling out to strangers and neighbors for any help that they might provide. It was a useless life, absolutely reliant upon others to generate a daily fear rooted in the uncertainty of a future. Will I have food for today? Will anyone? Be compassionate to me. Over the past 10 days, our lives have changed from the coronavirus. Schools have closed. College students have moved back home. Learning is being done remotely from home, either by electronic teaching via webcams and uh, online meeting softwares or via thick packets of Xeroxed materials. Graduations, proms, concerts, award nights, dramatic productions, everything that honors the achievements of the students throughout the year, they are, have all been suspended or possibly canceled. Businesses have closed. Workers have been laid off, and while keeping the managerial staff on as a skeleton crew, restaurants, bars, dining rooms, they're all trying to survive this time utilizing their drive-up windows or delivery services. Stores are adjusting their hours in order to give time to clean the stores every day and to restock the shelves with whatever shipment they get in. Online shopping services have become overloaded. One member telling me yesterday it was going to be a two-hour wait just to put the order in and then additional wait time for the order to be filled if it could be filled at all. Churches have switched from gathering places of people to online worship services and devotions and Bible studies provided by their pastors presented electronically. People face financial questions and wonder if there will be a paycheck two weeks from now. Isolation is becoming the norm. Hospital patients and residents in care facilities are no longer allowed. Outside visitors, even family, cannot visit. Even pastors cannot visit. It's just the occasional nurse, doctor, therapist, 
social worker that actually goes into the room to bring a friendly smile for the moment and perhaps a few, few uh, seconds of longed-for companionship. Families are learning how to spend not only hours, but days together. For Oh, you've experienced that, have you? <laughs> We're already longing for freedom. Freedom from our homes. The news raises anxiety. News raises fear in people, perhaps even within some of you. The numbers of people who have contracted the virus continues to rise, and we are cautious when we're around other people. We're nervous that we might receive the virus, and we're far more conscious of our hygiene habits, even in performing our regular everyday tasks. The highest priority not only is keeping myself safe, but also in keeping others safe it's the unknown of this future that causes fear david a blind man and ourselves understand fear when david was on the run from saul he wrote three psalms one of them we already read today psalm 140 42 41 41 and he also read, wrote Psalm 56 and Psalm 57. And they were all written while he was hiding out in a cave. And in David's isolation, depression, pressure of the unknown, and fear all began to set into his emotions the same way it sets into ours. As we read these psalms, you can read his emotional state is one of anguish and one of exhaustion. He can't stay anywhere very long for fear of being found. He's always looking over his shoulder. And it kind of sounds like our nation right now. Many are emotionally exhausted already, fearful of being exposed to the virus, ever on the lookout for to avoid people who sniffle, sneeze, and cough. But we can also relate to the blind man, for we can't live life the way we would like to. We're stuck waiting for another person's kindness to leave something on the shelves for us to purchase. Like when David heard Goliath's challenge, David didn't lose hope. In the cave, he is honest, brutally honest with God, with what he is experiencing and feeling. He writes, I cry to you, O Lord. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of my prison. David pours out his heart to God because he sees God and knows God as my refuge. God is David's safe place in a hostile world. David couldn't see the end of his own path, but he knew God could. And the blind man didn't lose hope either. Every day he sat and called out for mercy and compassion from anybody he heard passing by. Jesus, who is all compassion, healed the man, and gave him the gift of sight, and with that gift, now that man could live and provide for himself, and he could also serve others who are in need. The blind man's path now was seen clearly. And you and I can't lose hope either. We hear our nation's leaders hope this virus is short-lived and that few people contract it. But we don't know. That hope is just that. It's a desire. It's a wish. Because they're waiting for hard data. But as Christians, we hope differently. When the Bible speaks of hope, it speaks in terms of confidence, in assurance. 
confidence and assurance not in ourselves, but in God. In Psalm 142, David said, you are my refuge. In Psalm 56, he writes, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. I shall not be afraid, for I know that God is for me. And in Psalm 57, David proclaims, God will send out his steadfast love and faithfulness. That is a confident hope in God. The hope David has was not just in God. That still rings of a wishful outcome. No, David's hope, David's confidence was in God himself. David was assured by God's own steadfast love and faithfulness. That's the God revealed throughout the Bible. God is faithful. God is steady. God is unchanging. God is ever loving. Solomon writes in Lamentations 3, because of the loving devotion of the Lord, we are not consumed. For his mercy never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Facing what makes us fearful, we become confident in the presence of God. Because his mercy, even though it says his mercies are new every morning, his mercy towards us is not new. His mercy towards us is constant. His mercy has not changed, we just see it afresh every day. David saw God's mercy afresh each day he wasn't captured. He saw the mercy refreshed with each bit of food he was able to find, with the shelter he was able to take, with his friend Jonathan to tell him whether or not it was safe to return. The blind man knew God's mercy afresh each time he heard a coin ring in the bowl that he set next to him, or each time he laid down in his bed at night, or when his eyes were restored to look into the face of Jesus, into the very loving eyes of God himself. And God's mercy has been shown to us and to all people in the death of that same man. Those same hands that healed the blind man were nailed to a cross. That heart that had compassion for this entire world stopped beating so that you could live beyond the grave for eternity. The situation of the coronavirus does raise up fears. But fear can blind us to see and know the love and the mercy of God that is right in front of you. Fear can immobilize us, can paralyze us. But God reminds us, I am full of mercy for you. I am your place of refuge. There is no need to fear. And so our leadership at Shorehaven, well, we're taking these days one day at a time. And as things progress, we continue to talk, we continue to make decisions. And this past Wednesday, our elders and church council met. And we looked at the worship numbers this past Wednesday night and said, the people are hungry. Hungry to hear the promises of God. Hungry to come together to know that we are not isolated in this world. Hungry to know hope and the assurance of God. And so we've opted to keep our worship services on Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings during Lent open and active. Hearing God's own word from Scripture suspends our fears. For like David and like the blind man, our confidence is in the mercy of God. And God's shown us that mercy in many different ways. In those waters of holy baptism, God 
declared to you his exclamation point. He said, in those waters, you are my child. For as David said, this I know, God is for me. In those waters, God showed how much he was for you as he forgave your sin. In those waters, God called you as his dearly own loved child. In those waters, your eyes became now focused on your path of faith in this life. A road that follows God, even when we can't see the end of that road. God himself feeds that faith in you. In the bread and in the wine, our Lord promises to give you his very own body and blood for your forgiveness and for the strengthening of this faith. The same body and blood that won forgiveness for you on the cross, God gives to you in this supper. The guilt over our lacking of trusting God the shame over thinking of ourselves before our neighbor's needs. We could list out all the sins that infect us, but there's no sin that the blood of Jesus has not paid for. As we receive that body and blood in, with, and under those physical elements of bread and wine, we are again assured of God's own words of promise. These are yours given for you for the forgiveness of sin. There is God's mercy, constant, every day, for you. Jesus declared that the sufferings of this world will often reveal that God is at work. The life and death of res and resurrection of Jesus is the focal point of God's work of mercy to all people, and to all who believe in him, he promises that eternal life. And so we trust in that mercy. In times of fear, we turn to God for stability. And he gives that through his word and through his promise. And our confidence in God now becomes visible to other people. As you drive out this driveway, people will say, they were in church. What does the church have that I need? We have opportunity to speak that assurance that we have not been abandoned. No, we're not abandoned. We are accompanied. Accompanied through this time with Jesus right alongside of us. And so we're confident in God's care. Now we reach out and care for others. And that's where God's mercy becomes very real. Real for many. Real through you. And so during these days, let us live as David, as the blind man, and sing with David's words in all that we do. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. Amen.